God except Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. Uh, we are forever and eternally grateful to Allah for raising up among us. First of all, coming uh, to America and visiting us in the person of the great Mahdi, Master Far Muhammad. And we thank him for raising from among us his messenger, Messiah, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And we thank them both for leaving with us one who has comforted us, one who has taught us, one who has inspired us, one who's literally protected and defended us. And that one that I refer to is none other than the honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. So it is in their names, beloved brothers and sisters, that I greet you in the greeting words of peace once again of As-salamu alaykum. sir. How is everybody tonight? Fine, sir. I'm doing good uh, as well. And I thank Allah for the privilege and the opportunity to be able to talk with you a little bit about, as Student Minister Willie mentioned, the cardinal principle of our belief in the Nation of Islam. I want to thank Brother Willie for inviting us to the city of New Orleans. Uh, we're having a wonderful time so far. Appreciate the hospitality of all of the believers. And I'm always eager to get a chance to talk to some of the brothers and sisters from processing and orientation and new believers and anybody, even if you've been around for a few days and you want more information on this subject, uh, we have served as a part of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's research department for the last five years and we have also conducted seminars uh, and workshops at our annual Savings Day convention on point number 12 of what the Muslims believe and uh, my student minister Willie asked me if I would uh, spend some time discussing this subject I thought so well I'm always eager to do it but do I need to develop another presentation uh, and I thought that maybe uh, you all could benefit from a presentation that we had developed uh, for our processing class uh, in the city of Memphis, which is where I reside. And one of the things that we have done experimenting with, you know, processing training and education is that, uh, excuse me, something is in my eye. <laughs> uh, but one of the things we've experimented with is uh, creating video modules. And we have maybe, I think, seven or eight video modules at this point in time. Because we recognize that in the, on the FOI side, and I don't know if you all have the same challenge here, but on the FOI side, you know, processing and orientation, the training would vary over time, depending upon who was the instructor or the depending upon uh, you know, what was taking place within the nation. So uh, some of the uh, officers from the FOI teamed up with the student ministers, and we said, well, let's see if we can resolve this and try to ensure some consistency in the training because you know, we're supposed to operate scientifically, right? You know, so whatever you put in, that controls what you get out. And sisters, you all cook, and you all bake. So, you know, if you go by a certain recipe, you know what the cake should taste like. You know what the cake should look like. You know how long it should take that cake to come out of the oven and be complete or done. And so... That's what our module system is designed for. It's designed that, well, whatever brother that comes, you're going to get the same instruction on point number 12, the same instruction on the restrictive law, the same instruction on the letter writing process, the same instruction on the history of the nation. So by Allah's grace, it's been working very well. And uh, Student Captain Anthony J., who is our captain, uh, once we kind of work out all of the kinks and perfect it, you know, sometimes when you're in the lab, you have to kind of work in isolation. And then once you perfect what you've experimented on, then you can bring it out before the light of day. But uh, we, 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 ha we have 
uh, done this maybe six months now, and so it's really helped the processing class come along a lot better. And one of the other things that you'll appreciate, Minister Willie, is that in these modules, it permits different brothers in the class to be on different modules. So in times past, uh, we got five brothers here, and you know, you're trying to come to class, but things happen. So, and then maybe a new brother comes. Well, when a new brother comes, the processing instructor feels a certain responsibility to start over. But that's unfair to the brothers that's already been there coming consistently for the past five or six weeks. We got to start over just because a new person came. So now with the video modules, uh, you can have laptops, you can have computers. And while you introduce the processing and orientation class to a new brother, the other brothers can be on the computer on what, and watching whatever module that they are on because the processing class is supposed to take eight weeks. So that's how this particular presentation came about. That's just a little uh, of the history of this presentation, the reason why it says uh, Muhammad Maj number 55 orientation class module. And uh, as you should be aware, uh, and, you know, there are things that are different for males and females in terms of our roles and responsibility, but then there are certain things that overlap. And certainly the knowledge of God is one of those things that overlap. So, brothers, I don't want y'all to feel that I'm divulging the secret FOI wisdom to the MGT. Uh, but this is general. And, uh, you know, what, what what the male needs to know is the same as what the female needs to know regarding point number 12. Now, as what Brother Stu Minister Willie also said, is that this is, this is going to be very informal. You know, I'm, I'm not up here to preach to you. Uh, but this, has, this is an exciting subject uh, that is one of my passions. So some of this presentation is not very long, maybe a little bit more spirited than others, but uh, I don't want you to wait to at the end to ask me a question. If you have a question at any point, raise your hand because this is, this is informal. You know, we're in a, we're in a classroom session. It's, it, it's not uh, uh, like a lecture format, but we, uh, we're going to go through the slides. And as I said, at any point in time you have a question, feel free to ask, okay? So the presentation is called The Knowledge of God. But Mr. Willie, am I also advancing that? Okay. Okay. So we want to start with a few definitions. And this is one of the things that is always important, and we certainly uh respect the, uh, the study technology that you may be familiar with with the, with the, uh, the Scientology org and their emphasis on clearing words. So we said, well, since we're going to start, we might as well clear a few terms. Uh, the, uh, that's the, the meaning, some of the meaning of the word the. Now, one of the things you'll find in the English language is that oftentimes the smaller the word, the bigger the meaning. One of the biggest dictionary entries is for the word A, you know, and the also has a big entry in the dictionary. But the word the essentially means because I wanted to define the terms that make up the knowledge of God. See? So the, it's a determiner. It's the definite article. It's used preceding a noun that has previously uh, been specified. Uh, it's used with a qualifying word or phrase to indicate a particular person, object, etc., as distinct from others. It's also used preceding certain nouns associated with one's culture, society, or community, as in to go to the doctor, listen to the news. It also means the best, only, or most remarkable. Harry's is the club in this town. Knowledge, it's a noun. The facts, 
feelings or experiences known by a person or group of people. The state of knowing, awareness, consciousness, or familiarity gained by experience or learning. Erudition or informed learning. Specific information about a subject. Uh, one of the old arcane meanings is uh, for the word knowledge is sexual intercourse. And any of you that have ever studied the scripture where it says, and Adam knew his wife Eve, it's a reference to that in the old English. Uh, again, knowledge, to come to one's knowledge, to become known to one. Uh, also, to my knowledge, as in I understand it or as I know. Ah. Uh, it's a preposition used with a verbal noun or gerund to link it with the following noun that is either the subject or the object of the verb embedded in the gerund. And they give you some examples. Uh, the breathing of a fine swimmer, the breathing of clean air. is used to indicate possession, origin, or association. The house of my sister. It's used after words or phrases expressing quantities. A pint of milk. It also means constituted by, containing, or characterized by. A family of idiots. A rod of iron. Preposition of. Used to indicate separation, as in time or space, within a mile of the town also means about, concerning, as in, speak to me of love. Uh, in America, before the hour of, a quarter of nine. God. God is a noun from the field of theology. Means in English, the sole supreme being, eternal, spiritual, and transcendent, who is the creator and ruler of all, and is infinite in all attributes, the object of worship in monotheistic religions. I think that's all of our one. Oh, I think I also define theology. It's not an everyday household word, but the word theology means the systematic study of the existence and nature of the divine and its relationship to and influence upon other beings, a specific branch of this study undertaken from the perspective of a particular group, as in feminist theology. The systematic study of Christian revelation concerning God's name and purpose, especially through the teaching of the church. A specific system, form, or branch of this study, especially for those preparing for the ministry or priesthood. Let me go back. So any, any questions on the meaning of those words? The knowledge of God. Okay. So next we go into scripture. Now, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and I, I hope at this point all of us in this room uh, should have a copy of that book. If anybody does not have Message to the Black Man, every. Okay, okay. I, I'm, not, I'm, from, I'm not familiar with the app, but if it, if it has that, then that's great. Uh, I would also recommend getting a physical book as well, if you can. Uh, but uh, you know that in that book, he begins talking about God. That's how he begins. And it's the most profound writing and teaching on theology. What the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says in the beginning of Message to the Black Man. So you know at the root of what he says is that all our life we've been taught God is a spirit. Elijah Muhammad stands boldly in the face of the Christian world and the Muslim world and said God is not a spirit per se, but he is a man. So you know, it's controversial talk. You know, and you can't just say that kind of thing and not be prepared to back it up or to prove it. So 
is God a spirit or is God a man? Now, I like to try to simplify things as best I can because you want you know, people to kind of understand where you're coming from and make it real easy. Now, we in the South, I don't know if they consider Louisiana a part of the Bible Belt, but I know where I'm from in Tennessee, it's called the Bible Belt. Okay. And so uh, that only means one thing, that the belief system of the people emerges from the Bible. And, you know, one of the things you'll find, I think we mentioned this earlier today, when you come to the nation of Islam, uh, you're going to learn a lot more about the Bible than you ever did as a Christian. Right. You know, learn a lot more about the Bible uh, than you ever did as a Christian. So we walk through some of the Bible support for the basic fact that God is a man. Let me start here. I'm having to advance both here. Um, so we start out by looking at how all of the major figures in scripture, they described God and they had an encounter with God as a man. Now don't lose sight of the fact that we're dealing with point number 12. And this is a particular approach that you may find easy to understand. Okay? So Adam's God was a man. According to Genesis chapter 3 verse 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. In other parts of the Genesis, we read where God created Adam in his image. I don't clear the word image. You could look it up. Uh, and that, that should be a critical part of your study. Uh, how many of us have a good dictionary at home? I recommend you get what they call an unabridged dictionary. That's the old real thick one that you, you, when you go in the library, it's on a pedestal by itself. You can buy those for your home. You don't just have to go to the library and use it. That's what you call an unabridged dictionary. Because I'm sure Stuart Minister Willie and his excellent writings on study has talked to us about the value of a dictionary. And even in the movie Malcolm X, where they show Malcolm studying the dictionary as if he became brilliant because of his study of the dictionary and nothing else. It was his study of the dictionary in tandem with his study of the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that made him great intellectually and he ultimately would go into Ivy League universities and defeat their professors in debate. So a dictionary is one of the most valuable tools that you can have and as you get a little bit more sophisticated in your study, you'll want to get a Bible dictionary. Uh, you'll want to get a dictionary of the Holy Quran. Uh, Scripture is a funny kind of thing to study because all of us in this room, for the most part, we, anybody here to speak other languages in here other than English? So all of us are boxed in into English. Now the Bible was not written initially in English. The Quran was not initially written in English. And whenever you come from one language into another language, there is meaning lost in translation. But one of the ways to overcome what's lost in translation when you're studying scripture, if you're studying the Bible, you want to be armed with a good Hebrew-Greek dictionary. Because the English Old Testament comes from Hebrew. The English New Testament comes from Greek. And you may even be able to find, I know I have a couple at home, a Hebrew-Greek Bible, where there's actually a Hebrew-Greek dictionary uh, within the Bible itself. Uh, and just to give you an example of why this is important, uh, in the Bible, and we've all heard this, where it says God is love, right? Yes, sir. Well, now, in, when that's written in the New Testament, that's coming from Greek. In the Greek 
uh, language, there's at least four words for love. See? There's uh, storge, which is the love between friends. There's phylos, uh, which is the love between brothers. Uh, from which you get the word philosophy or Philadelphia, which they call what? The city of brotherly love. Huh? You have eros, which is the sexual love between a, a husband and a wife, as in erotic or erotic, right? Uh, you have agape. Agape means unconditional love. Well, now when you read God is love, which one is it talking about? You don't know. Surely it's not Eros. Surely it's not Storge. When you go and trace it down in the Greek, you'll find that it's agape. Unconditional love for the human being, unconditional love for what he created. So that's just an aside on the value of dictionaries. So you see, Adam's God was a man. Abraham's God was a man. The 18th chapter of Genesis, the whole chapter, Abraham has an encounter with God. Uh, and I would also say, I remember Brother Willie Stewart and Anthony taught us a long time ago, you know, he said, you all got these Bibles that you get from the hotel, the Gideons. He said, that's insufficient for someone who wants to study scripture. And he made this analogy. Where did Cedric go? He's gone, maybe. We were talking about when we both used to uh, cut hair and stuff like that when we was younger and in college and stuff like that. But... He could bear witness to what I'm about to say, and anybody that deals with uh, hair or beautician, or even if you are a, a, a brick mason or a carpenter or an electrician, you know that whatever uh, profession you have, uh, there's a such thing as amateur tools, and they are professional grade tools, right? So now when I talked with Stu Mr. Willie this morning, he told me he was in the barber's chair. Now, when he goes in the barbershop, he's not looking for the little wall home cut set that you buy for $14.99 that the barber has. See? Those are amateur tools. You can use them, but you won't get a professional result. So that little Gideon's Bible, where you don't have no footnotes, no concordance, no scholarly commentary, no maps, it's just a Bible. You can have it in your home, but that ain't the one you want to use to study the scripture. See? Because it's an amateur level. And you are here now because you are enrolling in the classroom of God. And so in order to vindicate his supreme wisdom, you need to first start with what the wisest people of this world know. See? Because it's there and what the scholars have uh, written about religion. Because they're the wisest in the world of religion. See, now I know we grew up going to church. Anybody did not, did not grow up going to church? What well, a preacher shared a certain kind of knowledge, right? What you may or may not know is that there is a hierarchy to religious knowledge. So what that means is, is that you imagine like a pyramid. You are brother and sister John or Jane Doe. You right here, you sitting in the pews listening to your pastor. Then there is your pastor above you. But your pastor went to a seminary school. Right. And there are scholars, professors, whose job it is to study religion and to study scripture. I know down south, a lot of pre some preachers don't go to seminary. Right. Right. Some of them go into the back of that Christian Living magazine and say, hey, get your doctorate for $150. Right. 
then they sent off and get a certificate hanging on the wall in the office and have you calling them Reverend Dr. So-and-so and such-and-such. But the better ministers and pastors of religion, they go to a university or a seminary where they sit and they are taught and educated by the wisest people in the world of religion. Now, the reason why I say it's a hierarchy is because the knowledge that the professors in seminary possess and they educate the pastor, the pastor does not always come and give that to his parishioners. When he comes to preach, he's given you that which his denominational doctrine says he should teach and you should believe. So I'm just making a point that's an important point. You want to get you some professional grade tools. You don't want one of these Korans and, you know, I have a lot of different companies. Minister Willie there donate Korans. It's just a plain Jane Koran. So the English translation, no frills, no thrills, just, you know, just to say you got a Quran. And if you ain't got nothing else, it'll do. But if you want to become a student, remember now, in English, the word student, the minister said we should call ourselves student. Some people feel like that's a demotion, but it's really a promotion. Right. Because a student, one of the words for student is a pupil. The pupil in the human anatomy is the opening in the eye that expands and contracts based on the presence of light. So the minister is essentially saying that now as the believer, you're, you are the kind of human being who you no longer just live life by the seat of your pants. You're the kind of person who lives and breathes and reacts and makes decisions about his life on the basis of divine light as a pupil or a student. So, Adam's God was a man. Abraham's God was a man. Abraham's important. Why? He is considered to be the father of Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Abraham. So, really, I could stop right there if I wanted to, because no scholar could defeat my argument. If Abraham's God was a man, everybody who now claims Abraham, you got to claim Abraham's man God. End of story. Ball game. Checkmate. Yes. But you probably figured there are more slides. <laughs> and you're right. <laughs> so Abraham's God was a man. Moses' God was a man. See, we're just walking through the book. Numbers chapter 12. We talked a little bit about this earlier. If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? I like that. Because it's really talking about our father, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. See? And there are people that like to speak against him and critique him and condemn him. But Allah is saying in this, you shouldn't even feel that... Uh, you should have the right to say anything of this man that is unlike anybody else because I taught him directly. I didn't give him parables. I didn't give him symbolism. I gave him an even plain word to give to you. Moses, of course, was the great liberator of slaves. Jesus, his God, was a man. You said, brother, now you're talking. Why you say that? Because you know, when you go to your Christian brothers and sisters, they say, well, that's the Old Testament. I'm always fascinated by that. Because you say the Bible is the word of God. But you only claim to be beholden to half of it. So what do you really mean? 
you just a New Testament follower? Or, do, or is the whole Bible the word of God? Somewhere in the scripture says, in all of scripture, there's benefit in all of scripture. And you, say, you can't say that in this regard because, again, Jesus never claimed to represent a different God. And to Muslims, neither did Prophet Muhammad. See, this is the handcuffing of those who want to argue that the scripture does not describe God as a man. You may not want to believe he's a man. Well, then don't claim to base your belief on scripture. Because if you base your belief on scripture, you got to go by how the scripture describes God. There's only one place in the scripture where it says God is a spirit. <coughs> and even within that, it, ta it speaks of God as a him that is not a spirit. See, God is a spirit. And those of him worship him in spirit and in truth. They say, y'all Muslims crazy. Y'all worship a man. Well, what does the Bible say? The Bible says he's a him that must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. For well, such your father see. Got some students in the house. I'm not by myself. As the preacher said, I fear my help have arrived. <laughs> so yes see and this is the reason you'll find brothers and sisters a lot of people don't want to study because when you study you're going to have what you already believe challenged see? people don't want to study they want to go and hear some good singing hear some good preaching put on their Sunday best but you're talking about opening up the scripture and now following line by line, word for word, and trying to get an understanding for myself? Most, most people don't want to do that. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, Jesus. Almost forgot. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. This is, of course, one of Jesus' popular controversies with the Jews. They thought he didn't have an authority to teach them. They really were upset that he was condemning their hypocrisy. I thought about this, Brother Cedric, when the minister was talking, that the Jews told him, Brother Willie, that you don't correct us. That's for us to do. In other words, Farrakhan, you don't have any authority to correct us. We are bigger than you. We're better than you. We are the ones vested with an authority. That's what they were essentially telling Jesus. And he said, well, is, that, is it not written in your law that the testimony of two men is true? Two men now, not a man and a spirit. Two men. Jesus said, I'm one that bears witness of my authority to correct you and the father that sent me. So Jesus in his theology, in Christ's theology, he saw God the father as a man. And if you read the text closely, he apparently was so connected with him, he could bring and present that man before the Jews so that now... Tell them, Father, did not you send me? Did not you give me that assignment to condemn and correct them? See? Y'all all right? Yes, sir. Now, y'all got to have some questions now. Otherwise, I'll preach. <laughs> all right, go ahead, sister. No, ma'am, it's not online. <laughs> No, no, like, like I said, this is the, the, we can make this available to you. Anybody that wants it, we can print it off and make it available to you. Uh, like I said, it's a part of what we're developing for the processing class. So, you know, I'm really interested in y'all's feedback 
because if it ain't no good, we'll scrap it. You know, <laughs> but, but if it's good, then we can, you know, take it and tweak it and perfect it. And hopefully at a certain point, you know, we'll, we'll share it around the country, you know, but, you know, whatever I have, you welcome to it. Um, any other questions? I had to go into the Quran and, and you know, uh, Jason, you and I were talking about this earlier today. You know, see, we were talking about proving point number 12 to the Muslims, you know, because they don't like the Bible. And many of them say, well, that's a tamper with book. Well, we can't argue. It has been tampered with. But now Allah says in the Quran that a believer is those who believe in that which is revealed to thee, Muhammad, and that which is revealed before thee. See? So a Muslim is one who believes in Quran and believes in the scriptures revealed before Quran. See? That would include the Gospels and the Torah. What they call in Arabic the Injil. See? Now, we've already demonstrated that the God of the Bible is described as a man. And even in the other place, I think it's in Numbers. This is where Fred Price, you know, uh, went on TV and he lifted up that passage from the book of Numbers. And he totally botched the interpretation of it. And I wondered if he did it intentionally, Brother Willie, or if he sincerely just, I mean, before the world misunderstood what the scripture was obviously saying when it said this, God is not a man that he should lie. Right. Uh -huh. See? Anybody that reads it understands that it's not saying that God is not a man, right. Right. but it's saying that God is not a lying man. Right. See? Yeah, I, I could say, I'm not before you tonight that I should preach. See? What do I mean? I'm not saying that I don't preach. I'm saying that I really want to facilitate an interactive dialogue to make sure that communication goes both ways. That it's not a monologue, but that I communicate, you communicate, and that facilitates the learning process. See, Brother Cedric is an educational expert. He understands that in the learning process, the more of the senses of the student that you get involved, it makes the information that's being uh, shared uh, go further within the student. So we got auditory, and a lot of places that's all you have is auditory, but we also got visual. And I want to add to that the comments and whatever questions you may have because I really want you to grasp this and feel like you're a little bit armed when you leave here. I hope you're beginning to feel that way. The coming of God. Again, point number 12. And point number 12, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad does not say God is a man and that's it. He says that God is a man that came, that appeared in Amer America. So this next section is on the coming of God. There, there is point number 12. We believe that Allah God appeared in the person. Of Master W. Fard Muhammad, July 1930, the long awaited Messiah of the Christians and Mahdi of the Muslims. We believe, further and lastly, that Allah is God, and besides Him, there is no God, and He will bring about a universal government of peace wherein we all can live in peace together. Prophecies that God would come. Isaiah 35 and 4 says, Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Also, Isaiah 40 and 5, And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Obviously, the Lord has a mouth. Hmm, that's interesting. Second Thessalonians 2 and 8. Then that lawless one will be revealed. 
whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Probably one of the most popular and one of my favorites. Habakkuk chapter 3. <laughs> I see God moving across the deserts from Edom. The Holy One coming from Mount Paran, which is in Arabia, mind you. His brilliant splendor fills the heavens, and the earth is filled with his praise. His coming is as brilliant as the sunrise. Rays of light flash from his hands, where his awesome power is hidden. Pestilence marches before him, plague follows close behind. When he stops, the earth shakes. When he looks, the nations tremble. He shatters the everlasting mountains and levels the eternal hills. He is the eternal one. I see the people of Cushan, a black people, in distress and the nation of Midian trembled in terror. These are the Bible's prophecies that let the people know that God at a certain time would come from his hiding place and make his presence known. Yes, sir. I haven't seen it. Oh, did I? Okay, I'm sorry. I went back she here. Says, she says if you drop the H A B, you get you get back and you uh, make that U and A. Uh, hey, that's the ancient name of Mecca. Then she said if you look in the back and you drop K U K U, and it's how Arabic is written from right to left. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah See, it's so much. Yes, Thank sir. you, uh, Minister Willie. It's so much. Yes. You know, that's why when you really begin to understand, study become fun. Yes, sir. See, because you're learning. Yes. You know, you you remember the minister talked about fun, the definition of fun, in closing the gap. Mm -hmm. You don't think because you're coming to Islam, you're not supposed to have any fun. And really no more enjoyable thing for us to be involved in other than learning the knowledge that had been taken from us. Mm -hmm. And when you learn to connect the dots, when you learn to see the connectedness and what you're reading in scripture and what's happening in real life. And then as you grow, you begin to see in scripture and you begin to see a guide for your own personal life and growth and development. So it's levels to the study. Okay, we're there. Another good one. Matthew 24, 27 through 28. Here the coming of God is under the title, The Coming of the Son of Man. For his lightning coming out of the east shines unto the west, where America is. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, which is a dead thing, like black people in America, you know that word Negro means dead in Latin. Hmm? There the eagles will be gathered. The eagle is the symbol of the American government. Gathered is another word for united together, as in United States. Hmm? So here is a prophecy of the coming of God from an eastern place to a western place. They say that the farthest west on the globe is the United States. See, Hawaii is the 50th state out there in the Pacific. Once you, go, you, once you get to Hawaii, you can't go no farther west and still be considered in the western hemisphere. You're going into Asia now from the backside. You're going into the eastern hemisphere. So this is a very important scripture. It literally describes the coming of Master Farah Muhammad, who came from the holy city of Mecca in the east to North America by himself to save and deliver you and me and also to ultimately punish our enemies. Yes, brother. 
We have to be excited about that. See, That's the reason why the Bible says when God comes, it's a great and a dreadful day. A lot of people happy that God came. Other people sad that God came. See, Quran really describes it about how, you know, uh, people would be very upset and making excuses. You know, what that I had taken away with the messenger. Hmm? Let me move quickly. We only have a few more slides. Now we get into some of the Quran. Surah 59, Ayat 2. But Allah came to them from a place they expected not and cast terror into their hearts. Now that's a problem for Muslims because Allah is not supposed to have a geospatial position. In other words, he's a spirit, so he's omnipresent. He's everywhere all the time. What does it mean he got to come to a place? Well, that's how men are. That's how women are. That's how human beings are. If you want to be in D.C. for 10, 10, 15, you got to leave New Orleans to get there, right? So allow us to come and again, you know, as the minister likes to say, the people say God is love, but obviously when he comes, uh, love will be there, but perhaps also the other side of love, which is the hatred of those who have been the enemies of those you love. So he going to do some saving when he comes? He going to do some killing when he comes? <laughs> He going to do some building when he comes. He going to do some destroying when he comes. That is how the Bible and the Quran describe the quote unquote last days of this world. Honorable Elijah Muhammad said it will be very noisy as it goes out. Holy Quran 89 and 22. And the Lord comes with the angels, ranks on ranks, not Shaba ranks, <laughs> not racks on racks, ranks, see, like when you and I come to FOI class and we line up as soldiers, we come to MGT class, we line up as soldiers, see, because when a law comes, See, remember now, when Jehovah came to free the slaves in Egypt, he had to purify them. Scripture said that the, what had happened to them among the Egyptians made them other than themselves. So that look at Ten Commandments, Commandments was because God wanted them to be an angelic people. He wanted to organize them uh, as you read in the Bible, as the army of the Lord. So that law was necessary to help them like crutches to throw off the way of life that they had learned following the example, the wicked example of the Egyptians. See, a lot of times we think, man, look at our people. We kind of like, I don't know if y'all remember that movie Life. There was a character in the movie Life with Eddie Murphy and Martin Lawrence. They called him Can't Get Right. They can't get right, boss. And he was describing a brother that couldn't hear and he couldn't speak. Can't get right. So you can look at the black community. We kind of like that. We can't get right. Sometimes we do so things and working in a prison, you know, sometimes you wonder, man, God going to save us? For real? It'll test your faith. Because today we are doing some horrible things to one another. See? But that's why I'm glad that Allah did appear in the person of Master Farah Muhammad. Because he knows how to fix us. And you find that once we separate from our oppressor, we won't have all of the different uh, behavioral problems that we have today. See, some of us. In Dianetics, you know about being keyed in. You know about engrams. And I respectfully submit just being still in the same presence of our tormentor. 
We're constantly keyed in. Especially now. See, people used to hear the Muslims talk about the connection to the behavioral problems of black people today and the slave plantation. And they would say, the, the slavery ain't got nothing to do with uh, the brother selling crack. Slavery ain't got nothing to do with the man beating his wife. Slavery ain't got nothing to do with these youngsters and gangs. But guess what? The scientists, you remember a couple years ago, they cracked the human genome. And so as they have learned more about genetics, there's a field now called epigenetics. And they have determined that traumatic experiences literally imprint themselves on the DNA within cells and are transferable from generation to generation. In other words, you and I, as we sit in these seats today, the pain and the suffering of what our ancestors experienced during the season of lynching, during chattel slavery, during the Middle Passage, it's in our bloodstream. We are not separated from what they suffered. I told y'all if y'all didn't ask questions, I was going to preach. Brother Cedric, now I'm at 10%. I don't know if you have your charger. So, so that only means I got to be quick. I got I'm, No, you can't play with beer. Yeah, 39 minutes. Okay, we can do it. But it'll it'll take you all the way to zero. Okay, okay. Praise be to Allah. Oh, brother, I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you. Let me move quick. Y'all can't let me get off on these tangents no more now. Blame Minister Willie. It's all his fault. Okay. Um, Holy Quran, Surah 2, Ayat 210. They wait not but that Allah should come to them in the shadows of the clouds. Lord, have mercy. I wish I could open this up, but I ain't got time. With the angels, and the matter has already been decided. What matter? Huh? And to Allah, all matters return. I got to move. <laughs> People said, the nation of Islam, y'all kind of strange. But the scripture said, God said, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And America is a spiritual wilderness. It's a moral wilderness. Uh, this is the place where the weak ones who live in highly religious societies when they get tired of wearing a long dress they get on the plane and come to America because they can wear a short dress when they get tired of being faithful to their spouses they can get on a plane and come and be a freak in the USA huh? so this is a wilderness that you and I live in huh? and Allah said that he will make a way in the desert God come to save black people Again, we reference our source, yes, the coming of God and the gathering together of his people. More scripture. The Lord said unto him, take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their groans and have come down to rescue them. Now go. For I am sending you back to Egypt. So, I don't know if you know it or not, but you know, part of our work in the research team uh, is to document that it's really the black man and woman of America that are the real children of Israel. And Jewish scholars like Shlomo Sands, Israel Finkelstein, Zave Herzog, these are professors. They, had, they work at Tel Aviv University. And in their research, they document that the white European Jews who occupy Israel are not the people that is being referred to in these scriptures. Now, they stop short of where we go in the nation. 
and the nation, we say, yes, you're right. There's not you, it's us. They still wonder who the people are, but we've been taught that it's us. So when you read about what the children of Israel suffered, know that you're reading about the history of black people suffering in America written in advance. History written in advance, as we have been taught, is called prophecy. And we live in the day and the time of the fulfillment of prophecy. The Lord said to Abram, your seed will be a stranger in a strange land oppressed for 400 years, and I will punish that nation that enslaves them. See, that's the reason why we don't carry no weapons. Because the God that we serve and believe in, he's going to, after he give enough time, he give time for the black man to clean up, he give time for the white man to consider if he would do right by the black man and repent, but at the end of that time, see, our oppressors will be punished. That's the law of justice. I got to move quicker. God is a black man. Yes, sir. Uh oh. I angered some folk now. We're doing all right. Our Savior has arrived. I say, love your God. He is a black God, and He is forever and forever. There is no such thing as trying to destroy the black man. You can't do that. It is impossible. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The Bible says it like this. I am God also from the ancient of days. I am the one. Well, now, uh, the archaeologists and the historians have already proven that if God is the ancient one of days sitting on a throne, there's no white man that can claim to be ancient. They've only been here 6,000 years. Fact about it, as the time goes on, their scientists constantly do research and they arrive at conclusions in their research that vindicate the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's teaching. So the latest research I read, they said that they have studied the origin of blue eyes and that they can trace the origin of blue eyes, guess what? Back to being no older than 6,600 years. Huh? That's the same time the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said the process of grafting white out of black began on the island of Palan. Yes, sir? I can email it to you. It was a part of what we put in the time and what must be done for the minister. Make sure, make sure we get, I get your email. Daniel 7 and 9. Still, he's the ancient one of days. Hair like pure wool. Yeah. Holy Quran 15 and 28. And when the Lord said to the angels, I'm going to create a mortal of sounding clay of black mud fashioned into shape. According to Abu Huraira, the prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said that Allah created Adam in his image. Wait a minute now, let's reconcile the two. If you create a plate or a bowl out of black mud, that's going to be a black plate, a black bowl. If you create a man out of black mud, that's going to be a black man. And then when the prophet said that that Adam was in Allah's image, well, we already have established that an image is that which you see in the mirror. See, So that black Adam was the image of the black Allah that created him, according to the Holy Quran. Master Fahad Muhammad. Point number 12, one more time. We believe that Allah God appeared in the person of Master Far Muhammad, July 1930, the long-awaited Messiah of the Christians and the Mahdi of the Muslim. We believe further and lastly that Allah is God, and besides him there is no God, and he will bring about a universal government of peace, wherein we all can live in peace together. In the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day, 
while I was among the exiles by the Kibar River, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. This is a biblical allusion to the coming of Master Far Muhammad on July the 4th, 1930. The 30th year is a reference to the year 1930. You say, but Brother Muhammad, the fourth month, July is the seventh month. I thought you would ask that question. Have you ever heard, do they have April Fool's Day down here in New Orleans? Yes. And people play tricks on one another? You may or may not know it, but the reason why we have April Fool's Day is because under Roman authority, April used to be the first month of the year. At a certain point, a decision was made to make January the first month of the year. But since folk don't like to comport with change, a lot of people said, well, we've been using April as the first month all this time. Why we got to give up April as the first month and make it January? And so when everybody else went to January, some folks stayed with April and they were mocked and ridiculed and called April's fools. Well, if you start with April as the first month, May is the second month, right? June is the third month, right? And then you end up with July as the fourth month, but then you say it's the fifth day. Well, remember now that day begins in the Eastern Hemisphere. So when it's the 10th in the East, it's the 9th in the West. When it was the 5th in the East, it was the 4th in the West, the coming of our Savior, Master Farah Muhammad, July 4th, 1930. All praises due to Allah. Mr. Muhammad speaks, Pittsburgh Courier article, July 20th, 1957. He told me that he had traveled the world over and that he had visited North America for 20 years before making himself known to us, his people, whom he came for. He had visited the Isles of the Pacific, Japan, and China, Canada, Alaska, the North Pole, India, Pakistan, and all of the Near East and Africa. This was a mighty man. He had studied the wildlife in the jungles of Africa and learned the language of the birds. He could speak 16 languages and could write 10 of them. He visited every inhabited place on the earth and had pictured and extracted the language of the people on Mars and had a knowledge of all life in the universe. He could recite by heart the histories of the world as far back as 150,000 years and knew the beginning and ending of all things. You say, well, Brother Muhammad, I ain't never heard of no people on Mars. Let me ask you a question. Why does the United States spend billions of dollars investigating the possibility of life on Mars? So if it's such a far-fetched, crazy idea, why spend money on it? Matter of fact, the new film with Matt Damon, he's stuck on Mars. And they say it's a black man that's a scientist that has to help him to get back home. See, uh, from Mother Tynetta, Minister Willie, you remember she taught that her husband, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, taught that there were scientists in Hollywood who were inserting and making sure certain things entered into movie scripts because the white man does not want to say or not want to be blamed that he didn't get or that he didn't warn us when the end comes. I got to move quickly. It's a lot in all of this, but I can't unpack it in the interest of time and in the interest of battery life. Uh-oh, let me go back. For this reason, the scriptures say, when the Messiah was about to come into the world, you did not, to want, you did not want to sacrifices and offerings, but you prepared a body for me. Wait a minute now. A man coming in a prepared body. How was the body prepared? The body was prepared when a black man and a white woman come together for a specific purpose to produce a deliverer. 
And there ain't no message for you to go and get you one, brother. The work has already been satisfied. <laughs> Had to add that cautionary advisory uh, to our uh, teaching there. But I'm just giving you something on his history. Because you don't need to be in the dark on his history. Mahdi, what does that mean? From the Arabic root word hada, which means to guide, to show with kindness the right path, as in Surah 90, Ayat 10. <laughs> we almost made it. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. And to lead to the right path and to make one follow the right path till one reaches the goal. That's right. I'm still, I still can come from over here. We only got one more slide. Messiah. And I give you definitions of Matthew and Messiah because you know the Honorable Elijah Muhammad put in quotations in bold in point number 12 yes. that Master Farah Muhammad comes to fulfill those titles. So Messiah from the Arabic root word masaha, which means to wipe a thing with the hand, to survey, to wipe off the dirt, to pass the hand over, to set forth journeying through the land, stroking with kindness, messi, one who travels much. He so I already showed you that he said his teacher visited every inhabited place on the planet. So now, do you have any questions? Are you ready to join the nation of Islam? <laughs> yes, ma'am. That, that's, that's a good question. Well, the thing about it is that uh, they are right. Some of the Arabs did own slaves. Um, ever since the Muslim world, see, the Muslims, after Prophet Muhammad, they began to expand all over the world. And in their westward expansion, they encountered the Greeks. And historians literally give them the Arabs credit because their relationship with the Greeks once Greek civilization fell, it was the arrows that preserved Greek learning, which it, it, you really want to dig at the root of it. Much of it the Greeks had gotten from ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt. I say all of that to say is that as the Muslims began to interact with Caucasian people, Greeks and Jews and others, they began to deviate from the path of Prophet Muhammad. One of the things that we learned that their entanglement with the Greeks produced was the replacing of what we're talking about tonight, the, the idea of a man God, see? Because the Greeks under Aristotle and Plato and these kinds of people, they were the philosophers, and they was the ones who conceived of a formless, shapeless, immaterial being as God. Because as, Carca as a Caucasian civilization, knowing the innate wickedness of their own people, they could not uh, wrap their mind around the idea that God would be a human being because they had a low estimation of the human potential of what being a human being meant. See, so I, I, I'm, I'm coming to the slavery piece. The, 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 the Arabs, uh, they, be, they deviated. And so what you have is, is this. The Quran specifically condemns slavery. So any Muslim or Arab who involved themselves in the slave trade did so in conflict with the Holy Quran and the religion of Islam. See? It's just like, you know, if I go out and rob a bank, the news media are going to say Muslim in town robs bank more news at 11. But wait a minute now. Islam does not teach robbing banks. Right. Now, I'm a Muslim, but in that act of robbing a bank, I'm now in conflict with Islam. 
You can't blame Islam for my sin and my evil. At best, you could say he deviated or went away from what Islam teaches. He may be a Muslim in name, but in that act, he violated the principles of his belief. On the other side of the equation, Christians and Jews, they pointed to literal religious justification for their involvement in the slave trade, namely the curse of Ham. The curse of Ham that was created by the rabbis of the Jewish faith during the Babylonian period. They're the ones that created the curse of Ham. This is well documented. See, because the scripture talk about Noah, he was drunk and he was naked. And it says son Ham saw him and laughed at him while the other son walked backward and covered him up. And that while Noah, mind you, was in a drunken and a naked state, he cursed Ham, and he really didn't curse Ham, he cursed Ham's son, Canaan, who wasn't even present. And we are taught, led to believe that God upheld, upheld the curse for eons and eons of time that was given by his prophet while he was intoxicated and indecently exposed before his children and put the curse on a young man that didn't even have anything to do with it. See, this kind of foolishness evaporates before the presence of truth and facts. But it was inserted, and this is what uh, slave masters who were Christians, they could point to that, see, well, that allowed them to sleep well at night. See, because how could you be an oppressor and a Christian? How could you be a torturer and a Christian? You can't, unless somebody have made you believe that oppression and torturing black human beings is a part of a divine curse. That's your divine duty to uphold God's curse now. Because he made them to be hewers of wood and drawers of water for all of humanity. So a lot of, the, a lot of different people were, had their hand in that. But the fact that Arabs and some Muslims were involved in the slave trade is not a justification for the whole widespread condemnation of the religion of Islam. There's Africans in it too. See? So... I've heard that, you know, but it's part of propaganda. I remember we had a brother, Dr. Ray Hagens. A brother had invited him to speak in the city. And uh, we said, well, man, Dr. Ray Hagens, a positive brother, good brother. And we gave him an opportunity to speak at the mosque. And he came to the mosque saying that black people who left Christianity for Islam, they left one invader's for re religion for another invader's religion. We're looking at dude like, for real? You don't come in our house and do us like that? You know, he did it. That's why when, you know, <laughs> he threw in the towel after Dr. Wesley just gave a preliminary statement a couple of years ago, I was particularly happy, you know, because he subsequently wanted to de debate Dr. Wesley over the African origins of Islam. And then at, once Dr. Wesley went before and gave the, you know, once shots were fired, Dr. Hagen was like, well, see, really, I didn't even really come to debate. I, you know, I just want to be friends. Can, can, can't we all get along? But he had been talking out the side of his neck for a while about how Islam was this slave maker's religion. So in other words, he was trying to say, Elijah Muhammad got y'all fooled. He told y'all the white uh, uh, Christianity was the white man's slave religion, but actually Islam is too. So we don't have to really too much worry about him no more because, you know, he's almost like Reverend Jackson now in many circles, particularly after he was trying to justify the actions of Darren Wilson in the murder of Mike Brown. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir, Brother Cedric. Thank you, brother. Yes, sir.
That's a good question. See, be, see, because, see, theology, this theology is, is, is really pastoral in nature. This kind of, what I mean by that, when I say it is that, when you learn what you are learning about God, it should be a comfort, you know. You see, I get a little bit excited still, you know. I still get excited. This stuff turns me on. See, because at the end of the day, brother, if God is a man and I'm a man, see, and when we say man, we mean male and female. Because the Bible said male and female created he them. Hmm? So this removes the ceiling of impossibility that white people like to impose on us. If God is a man and he is your and my father, there's nothing we can't accomplish. Nothing we can't accomplish. If you want to motivate yourself, feed your mind this kind of information on a daily basis. See? This will help you rise and meet whatever challenges in your life. Was it not the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that said, after Allah, God's self-creation, he destroyed the impossible? Because the other part of this, you know, the, I mean, this is just a, a, a slice of a huge, large piece. This is just, this is just a slice. But when you go to the creator, who begins as an atom and becomes a man, Think over that. You can't see an atom unless you have a scanning electron microscope. An right. atom is not visible to the naked eye. Right. And Allah, the originator, a, a surah of the Quran titled The Originator, he began as an atom. You couldn't see an atom. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says in the theology of time, he began to rotate. In the darkness, see his motion, his movement produced magnetism. So other atoms who had an affinity for that atom, they joined him. It's a slow process. We don't really know how long it took. But we're glad that the process continued because at the end of the process emerged a black human being, a black man. So there's nothing you and I can't face and overcome. Whatever demons are in our life, whatever habits, whatever vices, whatever health challenges, whatever financial challenges, there's nothing we can't overcome. David said this, you are all gods. That's in the 82nd Psalm. How come the preacher don't never preach that? I guess that's Old Testament, huh? He said, you God's because you children of the most high God. Well, if I'm God, I can't be a nigga then because God ain't no nigga. See? Yes, sir. You know, as powerful as that teaching is and it reveals about ourselves, but why is it that even though, you know, some of us in the nation of Islam still struggle with low self-esteem? Listen, before you say that, and I want to, it is still the opportunity to interject and go back because I want you to do Yeah. In your worship or acknowledgement of God. Mm -hmm. So even in the prayer, you have activity. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. I mean, you know, and I would just say, uh, you're right. This is, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told Minister Farrakhan, 
a wake up message. Now, some people look at that to try to diminish the message. See, but like the term student, I don't see that as any diminishing the message at all. See, because when you wake up, you got to do something. See, this is a message to motor charge us. Come away from being lethargic and slothful and unambitious and non-productive. Because now no longer is the white man the standard bearer. God is the standard yes. bearer. Right. See? And what's in him is in us. Yes, sir. See? I think a lot of us have low self-esteem because we continue to be in an atmosphere where there are institutions that reinforce negative ideals of self. See? Every institution in this world is established with a fundamental ideology of white supremacy, which means white is good and black is bad. Now, you can go on YouTube right now, and they did a modern version. And I'm sure you probably saw this, Brother Cedric, where Dr. Kenneth Clark went in the 1960s. He was a friend of Brother Malcolm. He did the doll test. I think NBC and Brian Williams did one just a couple years ago. And the one they did a couple years ago was even worse than the one they did 50 years ago. Because now they added white children to the mix. See? And the little black children. Now you know their mother and their father didn't teach them nothing uh, bad about themselves. Where did they get that from? Who is the pretty child? They pointed to the white one. Who is the uh, the, the good child, the smart child, they pointed to the white one. This is in the 2000s. Who was the ugly child? They pointed to the black one. Who was the dumb child? They pointed to the black one. Who was the child uh, as bad acting all the time? They pointed to the black one. Then in the question that breaks your heart, when they ask the child, which one looks like you? That's the part that breaks your heart. Because then it dawns on the child. I look like the dumb child. I look like the bad acting child. Huh? So we bring that into the nation of Islam. We bring it into the nation with us. And if we don't stay constantly in this, see, the mosque is the reason why they call this space a sanctuary. It ain't just a term we borrowed from Christianity. A sanctu sanctuary is a refuge. Yes, it is. It's a safe place. Do you know that Muhammad's mosque is the only place black people can assemble that white people are not allowed? Think over that. This is the only place in America that black people can assemble and white people are not permitted. Every Muhammad Mosque is a study group all over the country. So this is a place that is set up to build us up, yes, sir. to motivate us. Yes. See, a place for us to feel good in our blackness, a place for us to feel good in our Islam. But if we stay away from this place and we drift back out uh, like Cain did, he went into the land of Nod. Then we're around people that, you know, make us feel like we are worthless. True. My brother, then I come back to the sister. Yes, sir, brother. I have a question on Master Paul. Mm-hmm. How do we make the distinction, or how would you explain the distinction between Muslims and non-Muslims? Because I'm not sure I Yeah, because like I just said, see, you know for yourself, brother, Master Farah Muhammad could not have created the sun. You know he couldn't have created the earth because that was already in existence when he got here. He was born February 26, 1877, which means he was not even here February. He couldn't have been God February 25th, 1877. So 
you, we have to understand, and all of this begs the deeper question, what is the process by which a man becomes the supreme being? See, if God is a man, a man can't live forever. See? So you go into the book, Our Savior Has Arrived. Read that. And Al Blaise Muhammad talks about that process. How a certain knowledge and wisdom is passed down from father to son. See? And that there was established 66 trillion years ago a circle, a council. You read about it in your Bible where they call it the 24 elders. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad called it the 24 scientists. In other uh, cultural systems, they're called the 24 adepts. Some talk about the Anana key. And all of your sacred spiritual systems have some reference to a council. That's a ruling council. Sometimes they were called a council of gods. But one of them is the supreme. So the originator, the one that started from an atom and ultimately became a man, he's no longer here. But he established a process because, in truth, what he created had not yet been perfected. And he realized that it would take longer time to perfect it than he, in the form that he created, would be here. So that's where the woman comes in. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that uh, the originator studied himself. Yeah. See? And he saw that there was another self within himself. And he created the woman. She fulfilled his desire for eternal life. Because he could deposit an uh, aspect of himself in her and be reborn again. Yeah. See? And that process can continue down the line of time until the work of the perfection of the universe have been completed. So the last one in that process, the latest one in that process, is Master Far Muhammad. All praises due to Allah. So that's what we're talking about. See? So Allah is in his person today. Before him, Allah was in another person. And see, the beauty of it is this. We don't even know the names of those men. We just know Allah. But at different periods in the history of man, that position was occupied by a different human being. See? That's why you know there's a President Obama, right? He ain't George Jefferson, is he? I mean, George Washington. George Washington. <laughs> But they both the president, right? That's an office. That's a position. And so when America was created, they had to create a process to keep someone in that position on on down into the future. See? So Allah in the person of Master Farah Muhammad, he is here to produce, what's your name? He's to produce Allah in the person of Brother Marzell. See? He's the one that when you really get into the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's teachings, he is the one that produces a nation of gods and eliminates the need for there to be a council of 24 any longer. They were primarily established to keep the knowledge of God a secret. But once the knowledge of God is made public, you don't have any need for them. Right. Be a nation of God. My sister, and then I come back to Brother Cedric, and then sister, I saw these two sisters, then I come back over here. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. See, one God dies, and, a, and, a, and another God is born. And the way the Honorable Elijah Muhammad describes it, and our Savior has arrived, you know, it almost appears as though it's from father to son in the same family, but it's not always the same family. But it's always a black man. And that's the process. That's why the woman is so key. See? And while always among righteous civilizations, the woman is guarded and protected because she was ultimately designed to reproduce God. That's the purpose, that's the idea behind womb man. See? 
That's the idea behind it. As the atom was in the triple darkness of the universe, the first cell of life is small, uh, just sperm mixed with ovum, in the triple darkness of the womb. And so the pattern of the evolution of human life inside the womb is modeled after how the originator built himself up in the dark womb of space. You should get Minister Farrakhan's 1991 Savior's Day message, Who is God? You going to say something, brother? I was going to tell you, Minister Farrakhan, answer this question. I was going to pull it up and not necessarily hear. Mm -hmm. you can, I got the actual lecture title. You go to YouTube and just free Minister It would. Go, go, you can find many uh, of the minister responding to this, as well as the entire lecture devoted to this 91 Savior's Day. Who is God? Which actually became study guide number 19. Do you all have the study guides? Yes, sir. We do. We do. But, because, you know, we could talk forever on that. Yep. Sister Phyllis? Oh, yes, sir. I uh, want to know, where, where was it documented, the information you said about the professor of Tel Aviv, where they, was, they didn't say who was the church, they mm -hmm. said uh, who they, that they are not the ones that are right in Israel. And my second question is, uh, and I've just been curious, and I just really wanted to know, uh, I mean, I know you know a lot of the history of the nation. Is there history involving those pictures, you know, with Master Carter and Hunter's pictures, people on Mars, mm -hmm. is, there, is there any history regarding those pictures and somebody saw them, was there any knowledge regarding I don't those know, pictures? I don't know of anything, of, I've never seen any of the pictures of the, uh, the language of the Mars civilization, I haven't. Okay, uh, so no not to my knowledge, I mean, okay. you know. The Minister Farrakhan and Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I don't think did I don't think that either of them did, but from what I understand it's it's in Jerusalem. And there was a uh they used to say that uh Shriners uh, would pay maybe six thousand dollars to the Vatican uh to go and see the body of Jesus. Um you know, I don't know about that today. You know, that's an old myth. Uh, that needs to be vetted. Uh, but I do know that in the New York Times, in the, maybe the 50s, I had to check my files, uh, one of the Pope's assistants was fired because when one of the Popes died, he told a newspaper that the Pope was embalmed the same way they embalmed Jesus. So he was fired. Because, of course, Christian teaching is that Jesus is in heaven with God. So he kind of let the cat out the bag a little bit. My man lost his job. Bless his heart. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Shlomo Sands, he wrote a book called The Invention of the Jewish People. Um, I don't, I don't, I've forgotten what... Professor Zave Herzog book is called, but uh, Professor Israel Finkelstein wrote a book called The Bible Unearthed. Um, and if uh, if you email me at brotherdemetric at gmail.com, I can send you some quotes from them. That's brotherdemetric at gmail. Yes, yes. Yes, because we talk about them in detail in another pre in one of our defending Farrakhan presentations. Is it brother? Spell it out. Yeah, it's brother spelled out B R O T H E R D E M E T R I C. And I think, brother Jason, did you set a table up for us? If he set some of my books and DVDs up, uh, 
uh, when we conclude, I'll give you my card, and it's it's on there. But uh, it's brotherdemetric at gmail.com, B-R-O-T-H-E-R-D-E-M-E-T-R-I-C at gmail.com. And uh, I can send you some, some of the slides from those presentations because uh, that is, uh, you know, that's fascinating. Matter of fact, you can also look up Rabbi David Wolpe. W O L P E. He was the pulpit rabbi. He was awarded the pulpit rabbi of the year in I think 2000. He's from uh, Sinai Temple in Los Angeles, and then uh, he is uh, he got a lot of notoriety because he went before his congregation and told them that you know Passover and all of that was just symbolic, that it was not historical, that they, they their people never were in bondage uh, in Egypt. So he, he caused a big stir uh, because essentially he said that people have been talking about this for years, but many in the Jewish community were kind of in denial about it. So, but yeah, but so that that's a you know, some of this stuff, it's amazing that it's available because so many people don't know it. You know, but that tells me that those in power are that comfortable in their dumbing down of the American people. They're confident that they allow people to publish the truth online and in books. They know it's available, but they know that Lil Wayne got our attention and Nicki Minaj got our attention and who won the football game got our attention and on true, like trying to get some true religion genes got our attention and, you know, so, they're not worried about us learning the true history of ourselves, learning the true history of Jesus. They're not worried about that. They laugh at the Muslims. They told this to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in the 40s. They said, Elijah, trying to teach your people Islam is like trying to put pants on an elephant. That's what they told him. In other words, we have these Negroes so convoluted, so screwed up, so backwards, you will not be able to make them Muslims. And Mr. Muhammad said, well, sir, there's a judge told him this. That, well, Your Honor, I got one pant leg on already. So uh, any other questions or comments? Just, just the last part that you just said. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, when you come from the holy city of Mecca to America, you coming down. See. <laughs> That, that, that's a highly civilized place to come to a place. See, they don't have no such thing as Daisy Dukes and booty shorts in Mecca. See, you don't have to worry about seeing women walking up and down the street selling themselves in Mecca. Or men, for that matter. But they're doing that now in America. See, so for a man to come from that high civilization to a place where anything goes, that's a proper description. I'm going down. Did Mary J sing that song? I'm going down when you ain't around. Huh? <laughs> Praise be to Allah. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. No, you, it doesn't have to be your last question. You're good. I tell you like I heard Minister Rockman say once. I didn't know what he meant when he said it, but I've come to understand it. He said this. He said, I don't know what I know until you ask me questions. And we've learned, Brother Cedric, uh, that in Dianetic auditing, they use the Socratic method. 
So through the process of questioning, you're able to access aspects of your mind that you otherwise wouldn't access if you was not posed with that question. So you cause me to go different places, and I'm enjoying it. So please, ask your question. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't I don't know. I I don't know. <laughs> I I don't know and that's you know I I'm a I'm a researcher and uh but I'm never going to tr- Yes, it is a it, it it is a policy at this time that we are not to take more than one wife. Uh, none of us knows what the future will hold. Is not something that is even a consideration at this point because of our low moral condition as a people, and sometimes men are excited by that potential because of the ability to be with more than one woman, when most have not the ability to care for and adequately provide for one woman in one household. See, what a lot of people don't realize is that Islamic polygamy is not like the polygamy you see in Utah, where you see a man in a house with five or ten wives and hundreds of children. No, in Islam, every wife had to have her own home. So now if you're struggling to pay rent in a two-bedroom apartment, brother, you don't need to be talking about trying to get another wife. Because it ain't on her to provide for herself. See, So we're not really even in a position, to be frank about it, to even broach the subject, you know, intelligently. But, you know, Allah is a providential God. So that's there if conditions ever merit that we have to resort to that. In the life of the early Muslims, you may know something of that history. The Muslims literally had to fight to establish their religion. And in those battles, many times, since men were on the battlefield, women were left, children were left. And in early Arabian agrarian societies, women didn't have jobs. They couldn't go down and work at the bank, teach school, be a school bus driver. Huh? So women were heavily dependent upon men for their livelihood, for their maintenance, for their protection, for their sustenance. So if a woman's husband died in battle, now there's a woman with children that's left without any maintainer or protector. So Allah told the Muslim men, you could take up to four wives because there's a condition now where there's a great surplus of women and children. See? So some people look at the black community and they make those arguments because we, we are in a dire situation in terms of marriageable men. No, that's a reality. That's a fact. But because of our moral condition and because of our uh, inability to provide most of us for ourselves, uh, it's, you know, untenable at this point in time. But only the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan could say that that's something that uh, we should involve ourselves in. When he introduced study guide number 18, and I don't know if you have the self-improvement study guides, but you should get them. At the introduction to study guide 18, he gave a stern warning that if any brother took on wives, he will be put out of the nation. So, a well, good question. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. You know, but I mean, I guess uh, I'm trying to reconcile him being there. What? Uh, what where was he there? You know. Mm -hmm. The does that uh, is it reasonable to say that at the time Master Party Muhammad was in Mecca, the Mecca was not in a deteriorating or corrupt state that like it is now. Well, that's easy to look at. We can go and look at the history of Mecca in the late 1800s. We do know uh, that uh, in World War I, uh, which uh, was, is very significant in world history and the history of Islam, that the British, uh, you know, in World War I, see, today you have all these little nation states in the Middle East. Uh, before the end of World War I, they were all united under Ottoman rule under the Ottoman Empire that was headquartered in Turkey. So the Turks ruled the Middle East. Well, in World War I, they were on the opposite side of the war with America and Europe. And so uh, there was a, a British officer by the name of T.E. Lawrence. Uh, I'm sure you may have heard Minister Robert Muhammad of Houston, your regional minister, talk about this because he visited Turkey. He's an expert in what I'm about to tell you. But T.E. Lawrence was responsible for going into Saudi Arabia. And his job was, see, you heard how the minister say, dis, uh, or the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, dissatisfaction brings about a change, right? So even though the Turks were ruling the Middle East, everybody wasn't happy with the Turks under their rule. And the, and the Arabians, the Saudis, were not happy. They didn't like being under the Turks' rule. Yet, they were Muslims, and the Turks were Muslims. So when the British came a-calling, they said, well, look, if you help us defeat the Turks and we win, we'll set you up, and you'll be independent. See? And so T.E. Lawrence, they, he was so successful, they made a movie about him, Lawrence of Arabia. You may have saw it. That was about real history. It was a historic, historically based movie. But the Arabs did cooperate with the British to overthrow the Turks in World War I. T. E. Lawrence, that was his post, you know, to go among the Arabs, you know, organize, similar to you read message to the black man. Remember when they came back from Patmos and Pilon, and they came among us in Arabia and began to tell lies, causing us to fight and kill each other. They did that in 1914 in Arabia. And so, of course, the Savior, I don't know if he was still there. He said he started coming in America in 1910. So he probably was no longer in that region of the world at that time. I don't know. Uh, but uh, Saudi did. That, that was the beginning of the fall of Mecca when they began to partner with the quote-unquote infidel West against their own Muslim brothers and sisters. At that, at that point in time, that was the year, you're saying, the latter That was 1914. Oh, 1914. Mm -hmm. That was when you had World War I, 1914. Yeah. Either concluded in 14 or began in 14. I don't remember. It began in 14. Mr. Willis said it began in 1914. So at the end of it, the Turkish power over the Middle East was broken. See? And then you had all of the little nation states establishing their own independent uh, relationships with America and Britain. And at this point, it's gotten so bad that, you know, Muslims are murdering other Muslims because of the presence of the devil. That, that I, I was, it didn't originate then, it originated earlier than that. Because you have to remember, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, after three generations, deviation would set in. See, so part of the deviation was when they became uh, entangled with Greeks. And the man god of the Quran and previous scriptures was replaced with the uh, god that didn't have nobody. See, so that was part of the deviation. You also had uh, the, when they began to, uh, 
there was a period of time around in the 900s when the Muslims said that there was no longer any interpretation to be done of the Quran. This was called taklid and very significant because it's another form of deviation. See, after the Prophet, the Muslims took this Quran, and as the minister said, the Quran is a key. The knowledge here helps you unlock other fields of knowledge. See, So they took this, and with their guidance in this, they built a world that was modern at that time, that was progressive at that time. There were Muslim scientists, Muslim inventors, Muslim governors, uh, Muslims were involved in the arts. They had a thriving golden age of Islam. Well, that came to a halt. And there are scholars today who write and ask the question, what happened to Islam? It used to be the intellectual light of the world. But in the modern age, the intellectual light is in Europe. See? So you think about your modern conveniences. Things like the microwave oven and the automobile and space travel. That was developed by the Western man who wasn't under the banner of Islam but under the cross. And in many who were atheists in nature. But the, the intellectual domination of the world shifted to the West and the East under Islam went into darkness. And many people point to this period of time where taklid, in other words, they came up with a doctrine that said there is no more need for what is called ijtihad. Ijtihad is reasoning. See, in Islam, we are taught that the main sources to make judgments and decisions is the Quran and the Sunnah of Muhammad and Ijtihad. Ijtihad is reason or logic. See? So, exactly, when we say Islam is mathematics, see, so in the 900s, the leading imams said that nobody else to, is, is to interpret scripture. And you end up with this season of oppression of thinkers, of those who essentially Islam became like Europe under Catholicism. See? Under Catholicism, people like Galileo, they had to recant, even though because Galileo, you know, the church official position was the earth is flat and it's the center of the universe. Galileo did some scientific experiments and said, wait a minute, the earth is round and it's not the center of the universe. They said, well, that disagrees with us, so you either recant or die. See? So you notice, even sometimes when you deal with Sunni Muslims, they really, they say the nation of Islam, Minister Willie, innovates. I think they call it bidda. See? Innovates. See, so innovation was condemned, frowned upon. You heard the minister when he talks about he going into certain places in the Muslim world. And he bowed down for prayer and dirt was caked up on his forehead. And he asked the imam, why are you maintaining Allah's house in such a filthy state? And the man literally told the minister, well, we were just trying to keep it the same way it was during the time of the prophet. See? So there's a lot of evidence to show that in the 900s, so the prophet left in around 630, 632, in the 900s, about 300 years, analogous to three generations, you could begin to see the early signs of the death of the Muslim world through the... Uh, forbidding of any more interpretation to be done of Quran because in that doctrine, in that fatwa that they issued, they said that if you want to know anything about Quran, you got to consult the scholars, which is the same thing they told the minister when he went to Mecca. See? And so the Islamic world goes into darkness. I remember reading a while back because 
I was looking a lot into this, and they was they were asking what happened to Islam, and it was like the previous year I don't remember which year, but America they had published maybe five thousand scientific journal articles. Uh, when you're a scientific or when you're a research on an academic level, it's a big deal to be published in, ac in an academic journal. So in America, uh, maybe. It's, uh, Four or five thousand people just in America have published. Other parts of the world, hundreds of thousands of people have published. But in all of the Muslim world, it was, the number was in the double digits, maybe like 75, something like that. It was a horrible number. So you prove that you are no longer following the path of the prophet when you no longer lead the world in science and development. See? Because Islam is a religion that is the leading light toward the development of a new world, see? But you go over there and you talk to those kinds of people, you know, the, the Salafia and the Wahhabi, they're trying to bring Islam back to the way it was 1,400 years ago. You know, they said a woman can't drive a car, she can't show her face, these kinds of things, you know, that's deviation. And, uh, you know, the minister, in the time and what must be done, he quoted a hadith of Prophet Muhammad, where it said that at a certain point, a black man would come and destroy the Kaaba. You remember that, Minister Willie? This was a hadith of Prophet Muhammad. I don't know what that means, but it's there to be examined and looked at and considered, you know, so... That world is in revolt against itself and is unworthy for us to follow it. In 1972, when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was interviewed by the press, he said, very matter-of-factly, he said, the old world of Islam was ruled by white people. The new world will be not, will not be. So, any other questions, comments? What time is it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we st it's still early. Y'all be at the club till midnight. <laughs> they ironing now, brother. Yeah, they ironing. Putting their linen suits together. <laughs> yeah, we in, fall, we in fall now, right? Yeah. Post Labor Day. Any other questions? Hope I'm not scrambling nobody's brain. Hope I'm not further confusing you. Y'all stop me if I start confusing you. <laughs> Praise be to it. Praise be to it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, because 19, you have 1914 World War I. One plus nine plus four plus one, you get six. Then uh, World War II is 1941. Same numbers, you get six. So that's the number of the beast. Uh. <laughs> Well, as I do, and the messenger talks about this some, and message to the black man, and uh, in other places. But uh, you know, the Savior gave him a Quran in Arabic, and then, of course, you know the story is he said, "But I can't read Arabic," and then he gave him one in English. Now, the Quran that he gave him in Arabic was not this Quran. You know, 
He wrote a Quran with his own hand, but it wasn't this. It was that new teaching that you talk about, you know. So um, that's already ready for us. But see, the God is in a, you know, is in a position to where, see, again, what we were given is a wake-up message. Couldn't give too much wisdom to us as long as the enemy is in power. So we have to suffer, in a sense, not being able to get more wisdom from the God because the enemy power is not completely broken yet. If you go into theology of time, there was a section, Minister Willie, you probably remember where a brother was, they were doing question and answer for the theology of time. And the brother came up and he said, Dear Apostle, last week, you said that there were two places on the earth that a person could go and not be detected. What are those places? And so the messenger told the brother, he said, well, brother, you know, if I told you, you would tell the enemy. Or if I told you, I would be telling the enemy. So he held that. See, That wasn't to be made public. What did Jesus say? There are many things I could tell you, but you can't bear it yet. Well, it's not so much that you can't comprehend it. That ain't what he's saying. But if I give you a knowledge and a wisdom before time and you can't act on it because other things have not been worked out or resolved yet, then that becomes a burden to you. See? See, when you begin to really get into, uh, I would say, some of that which, you know, there's always that which is said and there's that which is not said but is to be discovered for the curious student. You understand that in as much as God has always been the revealer of knowledge and truth, he has also had to be the ultimate concealer of certain wisdom and truth. He himself is described in the Quran as Al-Gaib, the hidden. In his attributes, he is the hidden and the manifest. See? So, like we talk about sometimes the King James Bible and how corrupt King James was for dis destroying the Bible. Well, that's true. But his work served the will of God. Because it was for Allah to come and give the true interpretation of scripture to a messenger that he would raise. See? So Allah is oftentimes not just the revealer of truth and sender of prophets, but he's sometimes the concealer of truth until it's time for truth, that truth to be made known. Was not that the work of the scientists? They kept the true knowledge of God a secret for how long? 66 trillion years. So we get a lot if we make it to the end of the enemy. More is forthcoming. But we got just enough to be proven acceptable by the God. Because the enemy seeks to make us unacceptable to the God. He told the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Elijah, you tell them. If they don't clean up, they are out of luck with us. So the wake up message is that which is to clean us. To be acceptable in his sight. Jesus gives it in symbolic language that the brides have to prepare themselves for the bridegroom. Yes. Just symbolism. Right. See, you as God's people are betrothed to him. Yes. See? So you, you've been taught in MGT perhaps that the Savior never took a wife. 
and he wouldn't take one until he had accomplished his mission. See? All of this is deep stuff. So he gave us enough that us as a nation could be betrothed to him as well. Because from us he would produce a nation and a really a world of gods. I'm really scrambling your brain now. <laughs> Y'all all right? Yes, sir. As long as I didn't uh, uh, scramble your brain too much, I hope you'll come back tomorrow. Yes, sir. All praises due to Allah. Any final questions? If there are no final questions, and we'll put you back in the hand of our illustrious brother and friend, your brother and mine, Stu Minister Willie Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. I think I got a little bit here. Oh, it's gone. We'll get you another one. Okay. Let's give Brother Dimitri another round of applause. Uh, and one of the things I'll just, this constant theme I'm going to keep always stressing. Don't be afraid to ask questions.